Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone in our audience, wherever you are in the world. I am Doug Silliman, the president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's program, Is the End in Sight for the Yemen Conflict? Let me introduce our excellent set of panelists. First, we have Eleonora Ardemani, a senior associate research fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. She also teaches at the Catholic University of Milan and at ASERI, the Graduate School of Economics uh, and International Relations. Eleonora, we're very happy to have you with us today. She has also just published a very good uh, uh, piece on Yemen. Uh, Dr. Gregory Johnson is a non-resident fellow here at AGSIW and the Associate Director of the Institute for Future Conflict at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Um, he is a a uh, multi-published author, served on the Yemen panel of experts for the UN Security Council, uh, got his PhD from Princeton University and master's from both Princeton and University of Arizona. And we at AGSIW published yesterday two new pieces from Greg on Yemen, which look at the challenges of Northern and Southern administrations uh, in Yemen going forward. So Greg, we're very happy to have you back with us today. Ahmed Nagy is the International Crisis Group's Senior Analyst for Yemen. Uh, he's worked at the Carnegie Middle East Center and at other institutions in the Middle East and Europe covering Yemen and conflicts in the region. And he has an MA in Public Governance from the University of Granada in Spain. Ahmed, uh, welcome. We hear you also just back recently from a trip through parts of Yemen. You can read the full biographies of all of our participants and also of our moderator at our website, agsiw.org. Moderating our panel today is Dr. Hussein Ibish, Senior Resident Scholar here at AGSIW. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of him in the past three weeks, uh, and I will leave it at that, Hussein, and uh, turn the microphone over to you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Doug. It's wonderful to um, be here with this Dream Team panel. I mean, this is, uh, you could barely think of three people better to guide us uh, on two pressing issues. One, that we've been thinking about for the past couple of years, at least, um, and, and in this focused way, is, and, and this is reflected, of course, in the title of this webinar, you know, is the end of the war in Yemen in sight? What does a post-conflict scenario look like? Does it involve, um, you know, sort of ongoing tensions between the Houthis and other groups in northern Yemen and Saudi Arabia? Does it involve partition? Is it a de facto partition which currently exists? Or is it a de jure partition yet again in Yemen? Is it a two-way or a three-way partition? Uh, all of these are open questions. And for now, the conflict goes on despite the existence of a sort of ceasefire i think our guests can explain what kind of a, a strange hybrid it is but it has it has cut down on the intensity of the fighting since it began uh, but it has not resolved the conflict in any way there's still um warfare going on in yemen and um and even if it's not at the scale that it was before it's very significant and very destabilizing so that's the first concern the second is the one that has emerged um uh, as uh Everything in the region has kind of reoriented itself like a kaleidoscope that got dropped all of a sudden and, and really re reoriented itself because Hamas decided to overturn the apple cart and put everything in motion. Um, and that has applied to the Houthis in Yemen, who have already uh, signaled the, through word and deed their potential willingness to get involved. But obviously, like other serious actors with alternative agendas or additional agendas beyond participation in what is again being dubbed the axis of resistance. That's the return of the repressed, if ever there was one. Um, you know, this Iranian network of mostly Shiite, but not only Shiite, uh, because of Hamas and the Alawite groups in Syria and others, and uh, the Houthis being uh, five or Shiites rather than 12 or Shiites, which the the others all are pretty much. Um, I mean, the Hashd Shabi groups, uh, Hezbollah, the Iranian government uh, uh, are all 12 or Shias. And it matters because there is a strong degree of vertical integration in the Iranian network around the IGC's Quds Force, which sort of runs the show. But it, it because it does sort of rely a lot on traditions of authority 
uh, clerical and otherwise in in Shia uh, history in the Middle East, there's a, a, a it's more of a stretch to bring in five or Shah rather than twelve or Shah. And uh, the Houthis have um, emerged independently of Iran. They are not creations of Iran uh, the way that Hezbollah basically was, and the Hashdi Shaabi groups mostly were, and others are. They are very independent. However. We're going to ask ourselves if they're being drawn into the conflict and if that means that they're being drawn into a stronger or more vertically integrated role in this Iranian network that dubs itself the axis of resistance. Um, if so, that changes the Houthis' role in the region and it changes calculations in Riyadh and elsewhere, about even in Washington, about what to do about the Houthis, how to regard them, and how to conceptualize and manage a uh, potential Houthi ruled northern Yemen uh, de facto or de jure state. Right. So that's my little spiel at the beginning. Now, I'd like to start with Ahmed because he's just back from Yemen. He's written an important article that I hope he'll also tell us about. So, Ahmed, let's start with you. Um, what did you learn on this trip? What's, what's the situation on the ground in Yemen? And what did you come away with? Uh, if you want to so point us in the direction of your piece, we'd be very grateful. Thank you so much, Hussein, and uh, I'm so happy to be with you. Um, I think that the, the key question for us at the International Crisis Group was, now we have truce situation or truce without truce, because the official truce ended uh, in October last year. But the situation nowadays is, um, you know, de facto uh, truce because of the ongoing talks between the Houthis and Saudis. Uh, and and the key question for us, how how the situation looks like on the ground, how local communities across Yemen uh, deal with the current moment. And I can, you know, uh, reflect on uh, three key points. The first one is the uh, collective withdrawal of, of, you know, local communities. If you go to you know, uh, different, you know, areas in Yemen, you can notice that because of the long time of conflict uh, from 2014 to today, uh, people became less uh, interested actually to talk about politics, to talk about what's going on. For them, you know, the main issue is that how they can, um, you know, focus on on their daily lives. I mean, how they can. Uh, find their their own livelihood, and this is the main the main point for them. Another uh, point in my perspective is the economic truce. We managed to have political slash military truce, but we failed actually to have uh, an economic truce, which is one of the key problems. I I heard some people actually in 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 Hadramut in in Marib saying that during the war, the, the economic situation was much, much better than today uh, because of the hyperinflation, especially in these areas, which is controlled by the internationally recognized government nominally. Um, people are suffering a lot. And we we all know that the Houthis are imposing some economic measures on these areas. In November last year, they just attacked the oil facilities and prevented actually, which you know, prevent the the internationally recognized government from you know uh, exporting oil. Um, uh, and later on, they they um, asked the businessmen uh, in in the northern highlands to stop uh, you know using Aden port, which also prevent the uh, government from you know another uh, source of income. And and lately they they stopped uh, exporting the uh, cooking gas from Marib. These three elements, um, you know, made it very hard for the government, uh, economically speaking, to to provide you know the uh, local authorities to, to in these areas with their necessities, which reflect on the uh, local communities on the ground. Um, the third point related to the zero sum game. Of course, now we have you know a much better situation if we are talking about the military aspect of the situation. But when you talk with the um, different groups, better for who? Ahmad, better better for who? Um, I mean, better for for everyone since you don't have uh, casual cases. Okay, there is no fight. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is much better, especially, for example, in Marib. In Marib in 2021, for example, the number of, of casualties was, was dozens on a daily basis. So um, nowadays with, with the current relative, let's say, uh, situation, stability, um, we are seeing, you know, a, a different, different scenario. But again, I mean, when you talk with, you know, with the uh, governmental forces, with the STC, with the Hadramis, um, or with the Houthis, they they still have this kind of mindset where the solution should be based on the zero sum uh, game thinking. I mean, um, I mean, the Houthis cannot see the other parties in the international organized government. For more, for for them, it's the, just the Saudis, and the other parties are just mercenaries. And they always label them in their you know media outlets, or they are a part of the Saudi-led coalition. Nothing more. They they look at themselves as the only representative of the country. And if you go mm-hmm. to the international organized government, the Houthis are just, you know, uh, militias and they just uh, made this military call and they have to be aligned with the um, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, which is not, you know, um, um, in the favor of the Houthis. So, again, we don't have this type of realistic, uh, 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 mature, um, you know, thinking where we can uh, deal with the situation and take it to more pragmatic uh, uh, results. So this is actually, you know, my key uh, takeaways from my journey. Uh, With the um, indulgence of the two other panelists, I apologize to them, but I do want a a quick follow up. What the Houthis repeatedly tried to take Marib, which is the economic hub of the north, and they failed. They failed because of Saudi uh, Air Force. They failed because of uh, Southern Yemeni militia that is um, uh, effective fighting force that uh, works uh, for the UAE, essentially, or is this sponsored by the UAE, their client of the Emirates. And they were unable to do it. And that means that their control in the north is not total. Um, it is a key, at least one key strategic area that they fail to control. But what I want to know from you, Ahmed, and uh, if, if either of the other two have thoughts on this, when, when we come to them, I'd like to hear it. How much control do the Houthis have in Marib? What's what's the relationship between the Houthis and Marib as, a, as an economic center? I think since the beginning of the conflict, Marib is the toughest uh, front line, the you know, uh, the most difficult, let's say, battle for the Houthis. They tried to actually from 2014, even before the Saudi-led coalition military intervention started in March 2015. But they 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 couldn't uh, uh, manage to take over the city simply because we have two key uh, 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 you know, two key groups in in Marib. First is the tribal resistance, which which is against completely against the Houthis, and they don't see the Houthis as a group that you know have the right to to control the city. And the second is yeah. the um, Islahi forces or Islahi, let's say, uh, members uh, who you it's know the, the brother. Yeah, yeah, that's the most brother. Muslim More brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're branch in Yemen. They 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 move from different areas in Yemen to Marib. So they became in Marib very strong, and they they mm-hmm. they joined the uh, governmental forces there. So mm-hmm. we have, let's say, the strongest resistance branches who are fighting the Houthis are taking Marib as like a position for them. So that the Houthis couldn't, you know. Um, advance towards the city. Of mm-hmm. course, they managed to take over many districts outside the city, but when it comes to the city, it was very difficult for them. Now with the with the current situation, we are seeing actually more, let's say, build up within Marib mm-hmm. to um, you know, resist any sort of, of attempt from the Houthis because they they think that maybe there will be no more airstrikes from the Saudi led coalition, so they are prepared enough to you know uh, resist any sort of inter um, you know attack from the Houthis. Okay, well that's great. Thank you. I'm I'm going to with with Eleonora's uh, permission. I'm going to I'm going to go to Gregory um, because uh, his recent work uh, 
flows directly out of that question. You were looking in your last two pieces, which are absolutely essential reading uh, for AGSIW that everyone can access um, on our website, uh, agsiw.org. Uh, Greg wrote two pieces, one about the prospects for a viable uh, post-conflict statehood in the North and the other uh, in the same question in the South. Um, so let's let's stick to the North for a second. And, um, you know, can you just describe to us what you think the essential strategic and political landscape looks like at the moment in the North uh, with regard to the post potential post-conflict environment? And, uh, you know, the, the fate of Ma'rib and the role of Ma'rib strikes me, at least uh, as a non-Yemen expert, but someone who's been following it, as really important uh, to this question. So that's why I asked Ahmad specifically about Ma'rib. And I'm going to ask you also to to touch on it, please. And apologies to Eleonora. We'll get to you right away as soon as we can. Greg, please. Yeah, thank you, Hussein. And, and Ahmed, thank you for that overview. For those of us who haven't been to the country for a while, I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, I think there's a big question that when we're talking about a post-conflict scenario that becomes really important, and that is – I've argued in in multiple places that the war in what we talk about is the war in Yemen is actual multiple different wars, that there's a local civil war, there's sort of a regional war as well. And so it's really the post-conflict scenario is going to depend on which of those wars is actually ending. So if the post-conflict scenario is Saudi Arabia and the UAE withdrawing their, their troops, um, perhaps the UAE keeps support, perhaps it doesn't on the ground to some of its um, proxies or, or allies, one might call them. That's one thing. But if there's a peace deal between the Houthis and the Presidential Leadership Council, that's something else. And I think that's I think what we're looking at right now is the former scenario, where it's most like that Saudi Arabia tries to extricate itself from the conflict in Yemen, but that in and of itself doesn't end the war. It just moves the war from sort of this, it, it takes away the regional aspect of this war, and then it makes it a local civil war between the Houthis on one side and various actors on, on the other side. So the Southern Transitional Council obviously is not friends with this law. They've come into clashes in, in a number of different situations. So I think that's probably the most likely scenario that we're talking about for sort of of, um, the next stage in, in the war in Yemen. And then I think when we're talking about the North specifically, that raises a number of interesting questions. I think the Houthis have actually had a bit of an easier go of it during the past um, nine, 10 years when they've been fighting the Saudi-led coalition, because there's there's basically what I called in, in the article that Hussein just referenced, a rally around the flag effect. That is, the Saudis, the Emiratis are carrying out airstrikes, the Houthis are portraying themselves as the local resistance to this, once the Houthis and Emiratis remove themselves from the situation, that dynamic changes. And the Houthis have certainly lost significant domestic allies. Obviously, early on, they needed um, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh in order to take Sana'a back in September of 2014. There was a sort of odd but short-lived um, alliance between Saleh and the Houthis for a couple of years. And then Saleh ended up die, uh, was killed by the Houthis in 2017. But Saleh's party has survived. The the General People's Congress, the GPC, is still there. And yet the Houthis are continuing to, to basically attempt to sideline the GPC. And they're doing the same thing with tribes as well. They're doing the same thing with, with the Hashid Tribal Confederation. And what this means is that the Houthis are trying to put themselves at the top of the pyramid, but they're alienating all of these potential domestic allies that they have. And when you alienate these domestic allies, they can turn into domestic rivals. And when the Houthis, right. who have largely been given a pass on governance over the past nine to 10 years, are finally required to govern and have some degree of accountability, increasing the number of domestic rivals then makes it that much harder. And I think the one thing that Ahmed hit on, which I would underline as well, and Hussein, I think this gets to the heart of your question, is the Houthis just simply don't have an economic base. So if you think back to the 1980s, one of the real driving things toward unification was A, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the South basically lost its, its patron. But the other thing was, were, were these oil and gas fields that were sort of in 
in the border regions. But now the North has shrunk significantly. So uh, the North Yemen in 2024 would not be along the same lines, at least if the war were to end today, it would not be along the same lines of what the North was prior to unification in 1990. And the Houthis would basically be without all of the oil and gas fields um, in, right. in Yemen, which are sort of in this triangle in Marib, Shabwa, and Hadramut. And without that economic base, I just don't think that the Houthis have any path forward for, for any sort of a viable a viable state that would last. So they're not ready for prime time when it comes to governance. But um, they also, as Ahmed was saying, uh, take a zero-sum attitude towards power. Uh, they don't really view other, treat others as legitimate rivals. And uh, we did have a question with, from uh, Aylin Junga, which is, you know, raising the question of federalism. Is there any uh, possibility of federalism arising as a solution in Yemen that can sort of uh, have de facto partition in multiple different ways that will allow Yemenis to kind of live together without the war never ending or going on, you know, for the rest of everybody's lives or something like that? What do you think, Greg? Yeah, I mean, federalism is something that always gets talked about in Yemen. It was talked about in the National Dialogue um, Council, and it's it's just never really a workable solution. And it's largely not a workable solution for political reasons. That is, the groups on the ground. So the Houthis are sort of headquartered in an area that just doesn't have a lot of natural resources. And so while they have a lot of political power, they'd be shut out. They don't trust um, the other potential partners in Yemen to have any sort of an equitable sharing agreement with them. And you basically have have the situation where with the Houthis, with the Southern Transitional Council, with Tariq Saleh's forces, with this law, with all of these various groups that sort of have not minimal military capacity, but they have limited military capacity. That is, they can't force other armed groups. This war has been going on for nearly 10 years. And if you go back to the beginning yeah. of the Houthi conflict, almost 20 years in a way. Um, yeah. But none of these groups can impose their will upon anyone else. And so they're limited in the territory that they can actually hold. And yet almost all mm -hmm. of these groups take sort of maximal claims on economic base or what it is that they want to do. The, you see the same problem that we were just talking about with the Houthis in a zero sum game with the STC versus ISLA. The Southern, the STC does not want a Southern state in South Yemen that would bring in all these Northerners who are part of the Presidential Leadership Council. They want a Southern state for, for Southerners. And this is really sort of the stumbling block. And I just don't see any of these, any of these armed groups changing their opinion, which means that federalism is, it, it's great to talk about from a, from, from a distance from DC or from the United States, but on the ground in Yemen, it just, it, it simply isn't workable. Just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's a viable option. So right. that's right. And it's not attractive to it, any of the parties, which is really, really, sure, no, you can't get any of them to buy in. That's why it's not a viable option, uh, because they won't go for it, not because it wouldn't work. Uh, I mean, necessarily wouldn't work at night. Um, very similar to, uh, you know, where Lebanon was a long time ago, where Iraq was a while back. And uh, this is sort of um, a... Uh, a, 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 a common Arab um, political disease right now. Uh, I want to come to Eleonora now with uh, really many apologies for uh, you know uh, making wait and uh, a lot of thanks for your patience. You've written a very important piece, uh, which is the best one I've read about the Houthis' relationship to the war in Gaza, which they have kind of like a lot of groups in the so-called axis of resistance. They've pecked at it a little bit. They've kind of poked their beaks a little bit here and there. Um, you know, Hezbollah maybe a little bit more, but you can tell they're holding back. Um, you know, some of the Hashd shabi groups uh, in Iraq and Syria have pecked at it. The Houthis have pecked at it. What kind of uh, relationship do the Houthis have with the war in Yemen and with the uh, with the war in Gaza? Excuse me. And with the um, Iranian network in the Middle East, because they are not a creation of the IRGC. And they have not been vertically integrated into this network the way that Hezbollah and the brigades, Fatimun brigades and other brigades in Syria, or the Hash, some of the Hashd Shabi groups, the pro-Iranian ones like Qatar, Hezbollah and things like that, um, have been. Um, but are they getting drawn more in? Can you tell us about all of this, please? 
Thank you, Hussein. Um, I still believe the Houthis are uh, the most external planet of uh, uh, the Iranian armed constellation. Um, they are a local movement and militia with a local agency, with local goals, uh, with a real uh, uh, Yemeni genealogy yeah. and voice. But uh, surely since 2015 onwards, the Uthis have uh, uh, capitalized on uh, the uh, Iranian support, in particular military support, in order to face uh, the Saudi military uh, intervention. And uh, the role uh, of Hezbollah has been uh, particularly crucial, in my view, since Hezbollah has uh, played uh, some sort of mentorship role uh, with respect to the Uthis, uh, supporting them to improve not only military capabilities with the Iranian-made weapons, but supporting the Uthis uh, process in, in, in building a, 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 an expertise, also uh, not only in guerrilla warfare, but also, for instance, in launching uh, missiles and drones. Also, uh, on the maritime side of the battlefield, uh, with, with sea mines, with uh, uh, waterborne and pro explosive devices, and so on. So, the role of Expola has been especially salient in order to understand the Uthi's evolution uh, within the Iranian armed constellation. Uh, there's another point that I would like to stress, and uh, you previously uh, mentioned uh, uh, also, Ahmed, the economic side of the war. Differently from other uh, groups who are related to Iran, the Uthis are not uh, dependent from an economic side to Tehran. Uh, they are not dependent on Tehran. They uh, control what remains of the uh, Iran, of the uh, Yemeni economy, of the Yemeni regular economy, and they also control uh, the economic smuggling networks. And uh, this is uh, this is salient in order to understand how much uh, the Uthis uh, are autonomous within this constellation, also in terms of uh, decision making. So this is the point. However, I see in the first phase of the Hamas-Israel war that the Uthis are trying to uh, show their uh, proxy face. Uh, for instance, with the attacks, uh, with drones and missiles uh, in the Red Sea occurred a few days ago, uh, attacks that, according to the Pentagon, were directed towards the north and against potential targets in, in Israel. And I think this was a message by the Uthis. They, not, they want now to show their proxy phase for two reasons. The first one is to uh, position, to better position themselves within the Yemeni uh, diplomatic activity in order to crystallize their de facto hold on the northwest of the country, or alternatively, in order to uh, improve their, their position at the negotiating table. And uh, I don't think the Uthis are ready and are willing to escalate against Israel. I think that much will depend on Hezbollah, on what Hezbollah will do in the uh, Hamas-Israel war. If Hezbollah decide to join uh, the war, for instance, opening uh, in, a, in a direct way the front uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Israel, or for instance, sending troops in Gaza, uh, I, I remember, for instance, the battle in Kuzair in, in Syria in 2013, when Hezbollah joined the, the fight uh, uh, alongside the, the, the Syrian army against uh, the, the, the Sunni uprising. So yes. if Hezbollah will decide to enter the conflict, maybe we will see uh, more attacks, more missile and drone attacks uh, um, from the, uh, the Yemeni territory against the, U.S. 
civilian targets in the Red Sea and uh, potentially Israel, since the UFIs now have the capabilities in terms of missile range to, to reach the southern part mm. of Israel. So the point is very sensitive for Saudi Arabia, since uh, Saudi Arabia has a priority number one, which is regional stability. Yeah. for uh, economic stability in order to focus on uh, vision 2030 to the post oil economic diversification uh, and they can't accept a vulnerable uh, neighborhood uh, and specifically a vulnerable uh, red sea right now that's an excellent explanation and uh you know you i really think it's so important to understand the way in which hezbollah has played what you call a mentoring role for the Houthis in their in their the evolution of their military um, uh, force posture and capabilities, what do they look like? Hezbollah is, was the first group created by Iran as a kind of an expeditionary force over uh, you know in the Arab world. It's the template. It's the model. Uh, in eighty two eighty three, they, they came up. I'm not saying that uh, you know Iran sort of invented it out of whole cloth. Uh, the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon was the uh, essential context for that. However, um, over time, uh, and in 2006, the Israelis discovered to their horror, Hezbollah evolved into beyond simply being a guerrilla group and a commando or even terrorist organization, um, uh, mobile fighting units and with rockets and missiles, into a hybrid, uh, in, into de- having conventional capabilities. They were able to take and hold territory. And in Syria, they were crucial to the triple alliance that that intervened in Syria in the fall of 2015 uh, to save Assad, who they considered, Iran had concluded, was about to fall. And so Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah entered the war in Syria, and the Russians reported that the best fighters in the whole war, including their own people, were actually the Hezbollah people. That's quite a long time ago. So what I want to ask you is, how do you estimate the Houthis' military capability? And as a second point, which is very closely related, how does strengthening their uh, identification with Iran and the so-called axis of resistance strengthen them at the negotiating table with Saudi Arabia? And how, this is a really an important question, how did it strengthen their control in the areas in which which they have um, seized uh, in the course of the war or which they operated from anyway? How does it strengthen their domestic political power in Yemen? I I don't think that's obvious um, to uh, outsiders. Thank you. Uh I would start from uh, the Hezbollah's mentorship role, your first question. Um, I I see this role, for instance, in military training and advising, for instance, in the Hezbollah's role uh, in the foundation of the Jihad Council, this military institution in Yemen. Michael Knight wrote extensively on it with uh, a a Houthis military institution with uh, an assistant from the Al-Quds, the Iranian Al-Quds, and a vice assistant from Hezbollah in order to uh, uh, integrate security assistance and and strengthen the the capability of the Houthis to to, to stage uh, uh, on the front line. And uh, I see the mentorship role of the Hezbollah also in uh, the Houthis' uh, new skills in, uh, in uh, manufacturing and assembling drones inside the Yemeni territory, which was another uh, upgrading in their, uh, in their uh, um, capabilities. But differently from Hezbollah, um, I see the Houthis uh, have a less Mm, pronounced uh, hybrid uh, um, hybrid connotation. I don't see the Uthis as an hybrid actor, since uh, the Uthis have uh, gradually evolved from a guerrilla movement able to uh, fight, to to uh, implement cross border rights, for instance, also against Saudi Arabia. Think, for instance, to the to the last of the Saudi wars in, in 2010, 
uh, and they have gradually evolved into a um, local a military player with uh, um, strength and military capabilities, also in terms of drone and, and missile capabilities. And, you don't, you don't uh, just to interrupt you, for, you don't see them as having developed that much conventional military uh, capability yet. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, but they have never proved this so right. far, in my view. Yeah. Since uh, uh, um, the Yemeni army, for instance, this is uh, another aside, aside reflection, um, the Yemeni army as for now, is in reality a patchwork, a collection of uh, what remains of the real Yemeni army, plus uh, a series of uh, uh, local armed groups and militias, for instance, from the south, which uh, have been gradually integrated uh, from a formal perspective into the Yemeni army, so they are institutionalized, but in reality are something different from the real Yemeni army. So uh, a, a real battle between the Uthis and the Yemeni army uh, wasn't, uh, in my view, uh, it wasn't wasn't so so uh, relevant during during this uh, this uh, this war. And the Uthis have never tested so far their uh, um, capabilities of uh, a conventional uh, player. So I, I think the the, the, the asymmetric the asymmetric uh, uh, the asymmetric uh, um, connotation is still uh, uh, prevalent yeah. and uh, the last question on on Iran yes I think that in the Yemeni landscape the Uthis proxy phase tends to diminish, to weaken their uh, uh, strength at the negotiating yeah. table. You would think so. Yes, yeah. for for the reason that uh, uh, one of my colleagues previously mentioned, the Uthis doesn't have uh, allies in Yemen, don't have uh, other groups, political mm -hmm. movements uh, or, or, or militias, uh, apart from what remains of the General People's Congress uh, right. as allies. And so if they um, strengthen their proxy phase, this can... Uh, be good in terms of deterrence, for instance, but it can't be good in terms of uh, a, a political a political solution or or, or a uh, medium to long term uh, uh, gaming uh, at the diplomatic table. Uh, that helps a lot, Ahmed. Uh, we have several. Just, oh, yeah, Greg, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I've... just to add on to one thing that Eleonora said, which I thought was fantastic. I think if the war in Gaza continues to um, increase. And if that becomes, if you see something from Hezbollah, given what it is that we were talking about earlier, I think the Houthis may see an opportunity to basically end this, this sort of tacit ceasefire that's going on, given the increasing conflict in Gaza throughout the region. They may see this as their best opportunity left in order to make a move on Marib while the U.S. is distracted, while hopefully Saudi Arabia is worried about happening with what's happening with Israel, with Palestine in Gaza. And so I think there is a a a significant chance that the Houthis will try if if the war continues to increase, if they'll try to make a move here and sort of add a little bit to um, to the chaos and what's happening. Just seeing that as the best opportunity they have they have left. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But you're you're suggesting that uh, the Houthis might break the ceasefire and make a a final determined push for Ma'arib, but not necessarily get directly involved in uh, lobbying missiles at Elat or uh, Israeli targets or U.S. targets or anything like that. I, I just want to or both or what? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things. So one, the ceasefire is it's not really a ceasefire. It's just basically something that both sides have agreed to. Obviously, there have yeah, been like some a, clashes an back and forth. Standing, right? It's an act. Right. But there's there's no agreement that either side has has signed at this point. Yeah. And I think the Houthis can obviously do both. They can make a little bit of noise with shooting some launching some drones, shooting some missiles that really I, I think the the odds of them hitting Israel. I mean, the Houthis are not they don't. 
maybe on paper they have missiles that can reach that far, but their track record is not very well. It's not even very good in hitting Riyadh. Um, you know, in, in recent years, it's increased. So they can make a little bit of noise there, but I think their main priority, and they can use that in the same way they used the Saudi Emirati bombing strikes early in the war as sort of rallying some domestic support that otherwise they might not have while they're trying to make a, a push on, on Marib. So attack might have been the name of Al-Aqsa. <laughs> right. The road to Jerusalem yeah. runs through Marib. Yes. Uh, yeah, it makes total sense. Ahmed, we have a number of questions uh, from Justin Alexander and uh, Charlie Mitchell, in particular about the negotiations between Riyadh and the Houthis, which which are ongoing. And uh, it, it may well be um, that um, the Houthis finally conclude that they uh, really have maximized uh, what they can gain on the ground through warfare. And it's best to get the Saudis out and show them the door so they can uh, get on with uh, whatever it is they want to do in terms of governance and ruling in the areas they control. So um, given that, uh, our viewers are really interested in what the sticking points are, uh, especially after the drone strike that killed four Bahraini soldiers on the border, which seemed, he says, strangely time. And uh, Charlie Mitchell points specifically to oil and gas reserves and what their role might be in these negotiations, if, if any. I'm not sure there is one, but, um, you know, is that something the Saudis really want to talk about? Or are they just looking for... Um, Security guarantees. What What do you think is behind all of this? Okay, um, I just have a quick comment on what. Uh, Please, was... yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, everyone. Let me just say, you're all. This is such a complex, multifaceted conversation. You're all invited to yeah. uh, interrupt each other and to add on and que you know. This is my questions are just trying to give shape to this it's not yeah. so please go ahead Ahmed. yeah uh, i mean um on the healthy involvement and mm -hmm. what's going on in gaza i think um the healthy leadership was clear when they said if there is um any direct military intervention from the u.s mm -hmm. they are going to intervene and I think this is um, related to three key do, points. Do you take that seriously? I mean, is there any chance that, that that it's bluffing or propaganda? No, it's not necessary for 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 you know the U.S. itself. Uh, uh, the first message is for Yemenis themselves. Right. No, I understand that. What I mean is, will they definitely do that? Uh, is it is it ser is it a serious threat? Or yeah, I mean, th this is another point, which is. Why they they put it conditional? Uh, simply, maybe they are not able to target Israel, but at the same but at the more at the same time they can reach to some uh, U.S. interests in the region. Yeah. Uh, and and I just was watching to the um, um, acting prime minister of the Houthi uh, government, and he mentioned that we are overseeing the Red Sea and we can you know target you know the um yep. ships at any moment which means this is actually um under their reach and they can uh, do whatever they 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 have in, in 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 their hands so this is from their side but another point related to the um the pentagon statement um it 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 was described as potential attack from the houthi movement we didn't see any sort of either acknowledgement or denial from the Houthi side, and I just I just was talking with for with with some people I who mean, just to clarify for the audience, you're talking about the the projectiles that were intercepted by the USS Carney. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. 18th, I think it was on the 18th. Anyway, please go yeah. ahead. I just want to yeah, I mean the the um uh, chief of staff at the Yemeni Ministry of Defense. Uh, Sagir Ben Aziz was visiting Midi, which is uh, on the coastal areas of the Red Sea. That time, some uh, reports talking that about that the attacks was the attacks the attack that moment was targeting Sagir Ben Aziz, but then the um you know it was intercepted by the um, um U.S. forces and said that the, maybe this is you know, targeting Israel. Still, it's a lot of confusion about this matter because I tried to reach out to some healthy, you know, uh, leaders, but they they um, didn't mention anything. They, as I mentioned, they didn't deny simply because that will undermine their narrative inside Yemen. 
and they didn't acknowledge because that will create a huge mess for them at this moment. So we need actually to understand this type of dynamics, whether it's something, you know, adopted fully by the Houthis or not. So uh, ambiguity serves their purposes. Exa exactly, exactly. This is this is the, the bottom line. So coming to your question, yeah, I mean, the talks between the Houthis and Saudis are ongoing, uh, perhaps with a slow pace. And I think um, both sides have interest, actually, to go uh, forward with these talks. The Saudis uh, have two key points from these talks. The first one is to secure their borders, especially after, you know, eight years of, of conflict. And based on their announced goals at the beginning of the conflict, at the, the, the beginning of the, the Saudi-led coalition military uh, uh, intervention, they, they said we are in Yemen to defeat the Houthis first and second to restore the uh, internationally recognized government. They failed uh, to do both things. And now they are looking for an alternative. Uh, because at the end of the day, even the, the main goals they announced in 2015 uh, were to secure their borderlands. So now they became more realistic. They are finding another type of intervention. The, Of course, the Saudis are not looking for an exit from Yemen. They are looking for an exit from the war. But at the end of the day, they will stay in Yemen because there is no exit. Um, and, and, and the second point, they don't want any sort of regional actor to have huge influence in Yemen. And that's why they are trying to maintain their in influence in many areas outside the Houthi controlled areas. And with the Houthis, they are trying to reach an agreement with them. And, and, and if we look at the history between the Saudi and Houthis, they are either mortal uh, enemies or close friends. They don't have something in between. And from the Saudi perspective, they need um, um, authority on the other side of the border to deal with. And the same thing actually happening in Syria, um, because at the end of the day, they have huge... Uh, what, no, explain because... what you mean by that. What, what do you mean the same thing in Syria? What aspect? Uh, because because uh, we saw the Saudi position against Bashar al-Assad for a long time, they they yeah. yeah they they, they to need fall. they need a, it's it's better for them to deal with an actual government in Damascus. Ex 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 exactly, especially right. in Yemen when you have more than nine hundred miles right. uh, border strip. So you need actually to talk to uh, the, the the authority on the other side of the border, regardless yeah. what type yeah. of authority you have uh, especially especially just... in the in the in the northern uh western part of the the border where um we have you know massive smuggling activities human trafficking and and etc so this for was israel's uh, relationship with hamas until october 7th same thing they had to deal with them or they needed somebody in control of gaza same thing all right go ahead I yeah. So I mean, uh, and and for for the Houthi, from from the Houthi perspective, uh, after eight years of conflict, they are obsessed with we are winning the war, um, and and they think that yeah, since the Saudi ambassador visited Sanaa, they are happy with that, and they always you know uh, send the message to their audience. Look, I mean, we are winning the war, and they are looking for some sort of political recognition, and at the same times. Uh, perhaps people who are uh, uh, watching Yemen closely can, uh, 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 you know, see what was uh, happening in the past two months, which is um, uh, the uh, Houthi leadership, say, uh, the Houthi leader, Abdul Malik al-Houthi, said the radical changes in Yemen, which is uh, dismissing the current government and trying to bring, you know, another go government, which is more uh, uh, technocrats. Um, and I think in my perspective, for from the Houthi point of view, they need to uh, consolidate their their position in, in, in the areas where they are controlling. And at the same time, try to do something, you know, um, um, maybe constitutional changes, because at the end of the day, we saw Abdul Malik al-Houthi dismissing the government. But the key question, what is the rule of Abdul Malik al-Houthi in the constitution that the Houthis uh, are 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 adopting so lots of things the Houthis are waiting for the right moment to do and I think for them if they have a deal with the Saudis they can find this space so 
we are seeing some sort of mutual interest between the two sides. But the key question, which is, you know, the, the title of this panel, yeah. is this the end of the conflict? It depends on which conflict we are talking about. I, I we, we, many, we, we have multi-layered conflict, yeah. so this is the end for the conflict between Saudis and Houthis. If it's the end of it, the that, that would be that, yeah. Now, yeah. That is what we have in mind. I don't think anyone expects that Yemen is going to be uh, peaceful and everyone is going to say, okay, we have a constitution, that's it. No, that's, uh, we're talking really about the regional uh, war that involves uh, UAE and KSA. So you've given us a very good answer on that. I want to yeah. turn to... to uh, well, uh, last, yeah, one ahead. last point, uh, 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 which is, yeah, uh, w uh, s uh, sometimes we assume that the Houthis will are, are convinced with what they have in their hands, just the North. You mean satisfied? It's, not yeah. it's uh, tactical. Oh, it's hold tactical. on. It's, Hang on. It's, when you say convinced, do you mean satisfied? Yeah, they are satisfied. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they are satisfied about what they have in their hands, which is mm. the if we look at the negotiation nowadays between the Houthis and Saudis, and I'm sorry I didn't answer about the stepping points in this negotiation. Um, one of the key points is the um, revenue sharing. Mm. The revenue sharing is basically coming from the southern part of the country. Of course, we have Marib, but it's, you know, small share comparing to Shabwa and, and Hadram. Right, right. So the unity of, of Yemeni revenues is something essential in the Houthi thinking. So they are talking about the unity of Yemen from different sides. Because mm. at the end of the day, they will not accept any sort of separation in Yemen. Okay, that's oh. extremely important. Uh, can I, can I add, add, add on that? Oh. Yes, uh, let's let's get Eleonora first in, and then Greg, I'm going to spend some time with you right after. Eleonora, go ahead. Thank you, Hussein. Um, so, some uh, short reflections. I agree with Ahmed that uh, Saudi Arabia has greatly downsized its goals in Yemen from uh, Resolution 2216 as it uh, was uh, remembered, to uh, the, the, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, goal, uh, which is currently the securing the border. Mm -hmm. So securing the border in the north uh, in order to protect uh, the Saudi territory and also the Saudi economic interest. And uh, the, the other priority of the Saudis, in my view, is uh, trying to increase their um, military and political leverage in the South, which uh, currently is still uh, in the hands of the United Arab Emirates and their supported uh, political groups and, uh, and uh, uh, military uh, groups. Um, we must also take into account when we think about the Saudi Houthi talks of two factors, in my view. The first one is uh, the Houthi's adaptability. The Houthis are, uh, uh, as a political movement, really an adaptable player. If you think about alliance making in Yemen, uh, we saw the Houthis that uh, uh, fought against Ali Abdullah Saleh and the Yemeni army, Mm, with, with these other wars between 2004 2010 as rivals. And then we saw the alliance between the Uthis and Saleh in order to derail the transition uh, in 2014. And then uh, again, another uh, shifting of the alliance with in 2017, the Uthis that killed Saleh. So the Uthis are really an adaptable player. And so it is not something strange, uh, in my view, that they are uh, talking directly with Saudi Arabia. And on the other hand, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is a pragmatic player with regard to Yemen. And uh, uh, Saudi policy in Yemen is mainly driven by uh, political convenience rather than ideological or confessional belongings. If you think about the Yemen Arab, Repu the Yemen Arab Republic in 1962, the Saudis uh, sided with uh, the Zaidi Shia uh, imamis against yep. the, the, the Republicans who were supported by Egypt. It was the, the so-called uh, Arab Cold War. Yep. And then the, the Saudi Arabia supported uh, for uh, decades uh, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, although he was a uh, Shia, yep. uh, Zaidi Shia. Another Zaidi, yeah. 
Yes, uh, um, but uh, he, he didn't uh, uh, mark the, his, uh, his uh, rule with uh, a confessional stance. Right, right. So these are two, two factors that uh, uh, matters in Yemeni politics. And the, third, the, the, the last reflection is about um, the, the more integrated role that the Uzis have uh, also in the information and propaganda system of the uh, so-called uh, Iranian armed constellation. If you remember, in 2019, the Houthis claimed uh, the attacks against the South Aramco. And but that it was... That is really silly, yes. really an ignorant person, but go ahead. And then, and then it was uh, proved that uh, uh, the drone and missile attacks against South Aramco came from the north, of the kingdom and not from the south. Okay. So this is a lesson that we must take into account when we look at the Houthis stance, rhetoric, but also acts during the Hamas-Israel war. Yeah, so yeah, they're willing to take credit slash blame for things that they couldn't possibly do. And and a lot of people say, oh, it was the Houthis. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, the day of the, an hour after Abke and Khores, I'm battling, uh, you know, Middle East, experts on Twitter saying this cannot be the Houthis. I'm sorry. That's just, you know, do me a favor. Greg, you've yeah. been very patient. So we have we have the negotiations. Yeah. We have the Gaza war. And then I have a, a whole other set of questions. That I want to talk about the South, but I want you to say whatever it is you want to say about the negotiations with the Saudis and about the Houthis and the Gaza war. Yeah, so two quick points. So first on what Eleonora just said, I think that's a great point because the Houthis were, you know, giving Iran basically a little bit of plausible deniability. And I think this shows the dynamic relationship of the Houthis in Iran and how that has grown and changed and evolved over the course of the year when, you know, 2014, I don't think Iran has command and control. And 2019, the Houthis are willing to lie and a lie that's disproved rather quickly um, and taking taking credit for, for the attack on Abqaiq. So I think that's very important to keep in mind as we think about what the actual role is between the Houthis and Iran moving forward. The second point on the negotiations and getting back to um, what Ahmed was saying, I can easily imagine a scenario where, say this is a deal between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis, and they come to some sort of agreement over, over the Saudi North Yemeni border. But what does that mean in Marib? So imagine a scenario where the Saudis withdraw, they withdraw um, you know, their, their troops, they, they say no more airstrikes, and then the Houthis go over what's essentially not a demarcated border, but, but what is basically lines of control. Then Saudi Arabia is put in a position, do we re-enter the war in Yemen to provide air cover? Ahmed, I think, laid this out very well at the beginning when he talked about the tribal resistance and Islahi resistance to, to the Houthis in Marib, but also the importance of Saudi airstrikes. And just given the terrain, the open terrain in Marib, there aren't mountains there, air becomes very, very important. And so Saudi Arabia, it, you know, as ever in these negotiations, the devil is really in the details. And so is this, are these negotiations going to be between Saudi and the Houthis about Saudi leaving the war and securing their own border? Or are they more comprehensive negotiations that have a role for the PLC and the Houthis and sort of trying to demarcate those lines of control? Because if you don't do that, and if Saudi Arabia is so eager just to get out of the war, then it could put itself in a situation where it has to make very difficult decisions six, yeah. eight, 12 months down the road, where it has to decide, do we re-enter in order to keep the Houthis from moving into Marib? They've shown before once they went into Marib, they could also go into Shebwa if they go into Shebwa, they can cut the south basically in half, cut Adana from Hadramut, and then the UAE can be right back involved in trying to protect some of its, its allies. So really how these negotiations shape up is going to be important, not just for sort of getting Saudi Arabia and potentially the UAE out of the conflict in Yemen, but setting up what's going to be, I think, the next stage of the war in Yemen. Is is uh, Right, that's very smart, and, and all of you are saying the same thing in a way, um, you know, on layers of this kind of nesting doll uh, that is Yemeni politics. Are the Saudis ready, willing, and able to represent the interests of the PLC? I mean, can they do, or, uh, you know, because I can't imagine they want the PLC there, uh, sort of second guessing Saudi uh, diplomatic, you know, decision making and giving them a, a essentially a veto. Um, but how can Saudi Arabia 
speak for the PLC, can it? I don't know. Can it just speak forward and say, that's it, we're done, you know, and, as a fait accompli or what? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great question. We and we talk about the PLC as if it is as if it's one organization, and it's really not. I mean, this is an organization that really the Saudis, to a certain degree, the Emiratis went along with it, but really the Saudis pushed, you know, internationally recognized President Hadi, who his legal standing was shaky anyways because of how the referendum went and and a whole long history there. But they basically pushed him out. And they tried to paper over differences between these groups with diametrically opposed views on what the future of the Yemeni state was going to look like. The Southern Transition Council, which is part of the PLC, and the PLC claims to represent all of Yemen, and it claims to be fighting for a unified Yemeni state. But the Southern Transition Council, which has a seat on the PLC, they say, we're actually fighting for an independent Southern state. And so the PLC is not talking with one voice. The PLC is not a unified organization. You have a member from ISLA and, and the STC. ISLA and the STC, troops affiliated with both have come into conflict. And I think for Saudi Arabia, this was sort of a last ditch attempt, attempt to sort of unify what they considered to be the anti-Houthi resistance. But this, the PLC will not survive, at least in my view. Um, and I'd be curious what Ahmed and Eleonora think. But in my view, the PLC is not going to survive the Saudi exit from the conflict. Um, the UAE is going to support its troops, um, its its proxies and allies on the ground. If Saudi Arabia is withdrawing, and Saudi Arabia has done its track record is 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 worse than the UAE's when it comes to supporting its sort of proxies and allies on the ground. So this that PLC coalition is likely to collapse, and then it becomes a free for all in the South. And who can win the South? But if the South is so busy sort of fighting amongst itself, the STC is fighting its laws, fighting. Uh, Alalimi's troops affiliated with him, then you have a situation where, the, again, the Houthis might be in a position where they can take advantage of that militarily. Okay, that's fantastic. But I want to get Eleonora and Ahmad's take in that order on the uh, the role of the uh, STC in, in the in the PLC. And what, what you know, you're absolutely right, Greg. So I mean, it's it's, it's sort of a uh, fiction, a fictional uh, uh, alliance or or you know, entity. So how does this all play out in the negotiations and possibly after the negotiations? You know, what what does this mean for Yemen as a whole? Uh, let's get Eleonora and then Ahmad uh, to kind of, um, you know, get in on that part because uh, it's very complicated. The Presidential Leadership Council was a Saudi idea and the Saudis uh, established uh, um, allowed the establishment of the PLC in Yemen in order to coalesce the anti Uthi front, which was very divided. And so they built uh, uh, an entity with a variety of uh, politicians and most of all military leaders on the ground, uh, leaders of uh, armed groups on the ground. But the point is that the PLC is full of uh, Emirati-backed leaders Think mm -hmm. to the vice president, as, uh, as Gregory mentioned before, uh, as Zubaydi, who is uh, the, the leader of the STC, but also to Tarek Saleh, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, ran a de facto fifth dome uh, on, the, on the western coast, uh, the Babel Mandeb area, Mocha, uh, and so on. But also Faraj al Baksani, the former uh, governor of Adramaut. Uh, uh, so these are our uh, uh, Emirati uh, close uh, um, leaders, people. And uh, at the end of the day, we see that uh, uh, the Saudis are uh, understanding the PLC is uh, not only divided, but has been fracturing since they have uh, pushed for the creation, for instance, of uh, nation shield forces. Uh, a new uh, military group uh, uh, which is Saudi back and uh, uh, answers to the leader, to the, the chairman of the PLC, Mr. Rashid Al Alimi. So, uh, this I think is the uh, first demonstration that uh, Riyadh acknowledges uh, its difficulties in Yemen, acknowledges that uh, the anti Uti front is more and more divided. And they are trying to revise their strategy, not only in the north with regard to the Uthis, opening to direct talks, but also in the south, trying to build some sort of uh, proxy-like groups, 
uh, I think, for instance, to the um, a National Council, who was founded in in, in, uh, in the south uh, um, after a series of talks and negotiations in Riyadh. So the Saudis are trying to support uh, and to to actively back uh, um, Yemeni groups uh, who can challenge in some areas of the south the strength of the Emiratis. Mm. Uh, since the UAE, despite uh, its military withdrawal from Yemen in 2019, is still uh, the leading player in the South in terms of influence, in terms of uh, patron-client relations, and also in terms of uh, uh, loyalty with, with, uh, with Yemeni-backed groups. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Uh, I want to turn to Ahmed, but I want to I want to narrow it. You know the question. Um, we're talking about the South generally and the STC, but uh, you know I also want to bring in the UAE role, right? We haven't talked much about the Emiratis. Uh, there's been some mention. Eleonora just did pointing out, and Gregory, all of you have mentioned, uh, you know, kind of differences between uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and how they represent, you know, oftentimes different factions, different interests, different whatever. Um, but what? You know, so uh, there are two things worth worth asking you specifically, Ahmed. One is if we're talking about the Houthis using this chaos to maybe take another stab at Maghreb. Could it also provide an opportunity to for the South to move more definitively towards a separation, a repartition of Yemen, and and uh, you know to make it de jure and and formal. And then the other question is, what what is the UAE's current strategy? How are, how is it being affected by all of this? And uh, you know, I, this is very broad, but you know, you kind of do what you can to address those things. I know uh, you'll give a great answer. Okay, great. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you asked me a question about the Bahraini soldiers, but I didn't answer, and I think this is related to. Yeah the um the um uh, talks between the houthis and saudis that's what um, that's what it was about yeah yeah because in mid september um uh, a houthi delegation visited the riyadh uh met with khalid bin salman the minister of defense in saudi arabia and the expectation that time was there might be an outcome from that meeting and what I hear that time is, yeah, the, the visit of the delegation is just to put the final touch on a potential uh, deal between the two sides. There was some sort of disappointment uh, among the Houthis. And in my perspective, the attacks against the Bahraini soldiers was a tough message from the Houthis against Saudis. Of course, uh, later we saw uh, the Houthis are trying to avoid to acknowledge the attacks, to show their, you know, willingness. Uh, but uh, what I heard later on is that they sent um, uh, a delegation to Saudi Arabia to tell them that, yeah, this type of attack is something common in the borderlands. And yeah, for them, there, there has been so many incidents uh, happening in that areas where the Saudi soldiers killed many um, of the Houthi fighters, and they mentioned around twelve just in one month. Um, so um, for me, it was like a message, but it's not um, a big issue that undermines the talks between the two sides. Uh, concerning the main points that we are having today, is I think first the. Um, rule of Saudi Arabia, whether it's a mediator or a party to the conflict, because Saudi Arabia is trying to, you know, portray itself as a mediator, not a party to the conflict, which is not accepted by the, the Houthis. Uh, and they always uh, say that, yeah, we are two sides and the mediators are just uh, the Omanis. And the uh, another point which is related to the uh, you know, issues discussed, with the, which is the humanitarian files at this moment. And perhaps the main issue in this file is the payment of salaries. Uh, they agreed on the main principle, meaning that the Saudis at some point will pay for around six months, some reports talking about one year, uh, through which during this time there will be 
um, committees from the Houthis and the government where they discussed about the restoration of the oil exports and talk about how they can deal with with the um, you know a coming period of time because for for the Houthis they don't want the money to be paid from the Saudis all the time. They don't want to create any sort of dependency on the Saudis. Uh, that's why they are asking for the payment to be from the revenue of, of the oil. Um, in terms of the technicalities of the payment of salaries, uh, these are, you know, the main, let's say, uh, uh, topics they are discussing at this moment. But again, as I mentioned, still, I mean, there's some progress, active engagement whenever we reach to, you know, either the Saudis or the, the Houthis or even the Omanis, they talk about, you know, some uh, progress. Coming back to your question about the SCC, I think uh, two main issues facing the SCC at this moment. The first is the divisions in the South, because the SCC is one of the strongest Southern movements, but it's not alone. We still have other Southern movements uh, who have, you know, uh, good influence on the ground, uh, not as influential as the SCC, but at the end of the day, they have, you know, huge influence. Uh, and the second point related to the uh, and, and and in the same uh, you know point we if we move to Hadramut for example they have different mindset they are not talking about separation of the south they talk about autonomy of their own region and the same thing actually in Shabwa and in 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 Al Mahra and even the STC narrative when they talk about Shabwa Hadramut Mahra. They are very careful in using, you know, the, um, you know, southern, uh, uh, you know, uh, the state because they know there is should be, um, there should be, you know, another uh, approach when it comes to dealing with the local uh, demands of these regions. So this is actually the first, you know, uh, a challenge facing the STC, and the second one is the regional uh, competition. Many of the conflict dynamics that we are seeing in the South um, are not, you know, um, uh, because of the demands of the local, uh, you know, groups, but because of the regional tensions between the uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and their aligned forces on the ground. So if there's some problem, you know, between the two, um, you know, uh, regional actors, we we saw, you know, the reflection of that tensions on the ground inside Yemen, which mm -hmm. has nothing to do with Yemen, but has lots of things to do with, you know, their relationship. And um, this is, can be seen in Adan, can be seen in Hadramut in the in the last, you know, few weeks and, and elsewhere as well. Um, uh, when it comes to the, to, to the UEE, um, of course, they are counting a lot on their aligned forces we know that in 2019 they you know decided to withdraw from yemen but they remained strong actually in the south through uh different actors local actors they are supporting including the stc the hadrami elites in the other side of 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 the country in um the western part tariq saleh al amaliqa so they have so many uh groups through which they are working and they are serving their interests in, in Yemen. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I want to ask both Eleonora first and then Gregory to, to also address the issue of the UAE's evolving role and their relationship with the STC and the future of Yemen, um, whether it's uh, broken up de jure or de facto. So Eleonora, please, you know, if you can address that, and then we're going to shift to Gregory on the same topic. Yes, I, I think uh, um, the fate of Adramaut uh, will be decisive in order to understand the future balances of power on the ground between not only uh, the uh, internationally recognized government and the STC, but also between Saudi Arabia and the UAE in Yemen. Since the STC uh, continues to, to, to threaten uh, while the Adramal to the northern part of the governorate in which we have oil fields. And uh, um, for this reason, Saudi Arabia is uh, pushing its back forces to, to increase uh, the buildup in, in, in Wadi Adramal. So I think this 
uh, internal uh, battle, uh, internal dispute uh, uh, within Adramaut will be crucial to, to understand uh, the, the future geography of, uh, of powers in, uh, in Yemen. And I would also um, like to add another thing. Um, Ahmed uh, talked about uh, um, the, the local uh, divisions, uh, rivalries, and identities in, in the south, uh, in southern Yemeni regions, also within southern regions. Think to Adramaut, for instance, but also to 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 Mahra and Socotra, uh, for instance. And uh, we must uh, remember that uh, the the federal reform that was uh, drafted and approved uh, in 2014, uh, uh, which redesigned. Uh, Yemeni uh, regions in uh, uh, four uh, macro regions uh, uh, generated a lot of discontent, uh, not only uh, by the Uthis, but also in, uh, in, uh, in southern regions. And so the, the, the reaction was uh, extremely negative also by uh, southern stakeholders. And this is not a good omen of a good omen to, to the uh, possible restart of uh, uh, negotiations uh, in the south uh, and uh, intra-Yemeni negotiations to, um, to, to design a, a new institutional architecture of the country. That's great. And I'd like Gregory to, you know, basically jump in on, on this issue. It's so multifaceted. Uh, you can take any approach you want. Yeah. So I'll just make a couple of points. So I tend to think sometimes of what's happening in the south um, like a very deadly game of musical chairs. And that is the music's about to stop. Um, the the war, or at least the international part of the war is about to end, the regional part. And there's not enough seats for all the actors in the South. So think of it this way. If the STC is in charge, there's really no role for Tariq Saleh. The, the, Tariq Saleh has a, has a long history because of his family, because of his own personal role in, in the South. He's not loved. He's not well-loved in the South by, by any stretch of the imag imagination. He's just, there, there's no place for him. What is the role in an STC-led South for some of the military forces from the North that have basically been in Hadramut for, for almost the entirety of the war? There's, there's no real place for them either. They don't have a seat. And if you look at it from the other perspective, if the STC is not able, this is probably um, the South's best chance to have an independent South under Southern leadership. But if Tariq Saleh or any of these military forces affiliated with Islam have a role, then you don't have an independent South. You don't know. You don't have what it is that the South wanted in '94. You don't have what they what they wanted going back to 2007, and then certainly since the STC was 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 formed during the war. And so you have this situation where it's going to be really messy. It's going to be quite ugly. There's going to be a scramble for these seats, and people are going to be left out. And the people who are left out have arms, and they're leaders of armed groups. And so what they do when they're desperate and they feel as though they're left out, I think is is quite worrisome from the perspective of wanting to see this conflict come to an end because there just is no easy there, there's there's no easy route to ending this conflict. That's yeah, and you you've written about that as the current conflict, even if it were to basically stop in a way, uh, or the Saudis would all it would do would be to set the stage for uh, a different conflict. Right. Or set of conflicts, and there's no way around that. Ben, you just there is there, no. I mean, Yemen has what we saw over the course of the war was basically a fracturing of Yemen into multiple different groups, and now you just have to go back to the musical chairs analogy. You just have too many groups and not enough seats at the table. Yeah. Um, and that's a real problem. And it's it's a problem not only domestically within Yemen, but potentially regionally as well, because as Eleanor, as Ahmed have pointed out, that Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they all have allies on the ground. And if they see their allies pushed out and if Saudi Arabia sees its interest, as Ahmed said, Saudi Arabia is not going to leave Yemen. They're going to have an interest in Yemen. But if they see their allies being pushed out, exiled, gotten rid of, then they may have no choice but to intervene back in 
Yemen, and then we're right back where it is that we started. Um, the second point that I want to mention just real briefly is on the UAE and Saudi Arabia. I think almost since the very beginning, the UAE and Saudi have had very different goals in Yemen. Saudi Arabia wanted to defeat the Houthis. They wanted to restore President, then President Hadi, the internationally recognized government of Sana'a. Um, they wanted to make sure Iran did not get a foothold, that they weren't fighting basically Hezbollah South on their southern border. The UAE, I think, partly because of geography, partly because of its own um, particular history, did not have those same concerns about Houthi rule in the north. And certainly the UAE interests in Yemen have evolved. And I think in many ways, the UAE has played a smarter role than Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And that is that they've stood up these groups on the ground. They were able to, I wouldn't categorize what happened in 2019 as a withdrawal. I would say that the UAE significantly drew down its forces. Yes. Um, but they kept, because of their training, because of their funding, because of their backing of STC, of um, the Giants Brigade and so forth, they have significant and I would say outsized influence in the South um, that Saudi Arabia simply does not have. So when Saudi Arabia withdraws, their impact in, in Yemen is going to be much more limited, whereas the UAE can completely withdraw and they can still maintain a pretty heavy hand on what's happening in the politics in the South. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. Uh, and let's bring in Eleonora and Ahmad to, to react to it, because I think that has so many implications. Uh, Eleonora, what do you what do you make of that uh, thread that Gregory was throwing out there? Yes, if we if we look at the role, uh, the ongoing role of milita Emirati military advisors in Yemen, I agree with Gregory, it was not uh, a withdrawal but uh, a, a massive drawdown of UAE's troops from, uh, from Yemen. And uh, the, the role of Emirati military advisors uh, in the South uh, is uh, still uh, a prominent role, I would say, especially in, not only in, uh, in uh, local, uh, in, uh, in support in local governance, but also in the countering of Shiite groups. Uh, I, I, I wonder uh, what can uh, happen in case uh, there's uh, a, a, um, an upheaval uh, between southern regions. Uh, this is an, an hypothesis uh, regarding uh, partition or, or greater autonomy for some regions, and which will be the reaction of jihadi groups of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Will Al Qaeda try to capitalize on uh, the claims for southern secession, or this is uh, a complete uh, uh, detached story? So I think that the UAE will continue to have, as they continue to have, a um, decisive role in uh, shaping the balances uh, in the South. And also in the um, managing of security governance, uh, especially in coastal areas. Continuing to take into account that uh, uh, jihadism is something that Yemen has experienced at least since the 80s, since, uh, uh, since the, the Afghan Arabs who went into to Afghanistan to, to, to fight uh, against the Soviets. So, um, we don't. Uh, uh, we we must not uh, um, underestimate uh, also uh, ACAP in these days, uh, uh, since ACAP seems uh, really fractured and fragile. I think that uh, the future reflections uh, on the shape uh, of southern Yemen will have also to deal with uh, uh, the reaction, the possible reaction reorganization, not only in safe havens, but also maybe in, in villages and, and coastal areas of the jihadi groups, starting from Aqab. So this Very is another actor to, 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 to monitor. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Ahmed, what do you make of, of all of these dynamics, please? Yeah, uh, on the UEE-Saudi uh, relations, I think um, there was some significant development uh, just last month when Tim Linder King, the um, uh, U.S. Special Envoy to Yemen met with both sides and tried to unify the agendas of, of the two countries uh, because it's crucial um, to have them on the same page uh, and to reduce any sort of um, escalation, especially in Hadramut. Uh, 
uh, because if if the tensions between the two sides continue, this will undermine not just only you know the situation and stability in the anti Houthi controlled areas, but also uh, in the negotiations between the Houthis and and other parties. Because at the end of the day, the Houthis will find no point to continue with the negotiation. Um, uh, when it comes to the PLC, I think the PLC, as it is today, is weak. And I agree with you, uh, Greg, when you mentioned, you know, different aspects of this weakness. Uh, but w- when it comes to the PLC entities, they are strong in the areas where they control. So if we are talking about Al-Amaliqa, they are strong. If we are talking about Tariq Saleh, they have, you know, good, uh, you know, uh, military position. If we are talking about, you know, Marib and the forces there. So again, we still have, you know, strong entities within the PLC. The problem was how to unify the agendas of these entities. This is the missing point. Uh, Of course, the Saudis and Emiratis, um, decided to slow down the discussion between them through having this type of of you know council but again it failed in my perspective and now the the, the PLC is facing uh you know so many challenges and the question would it be um you know this the the entity that later on enter the negotiations with the Houthis and decide about the areas where where, where the anti-Houthi groups uh, control, or we're going to have, you know, another type of engagement from entities in the sites, as the Houthis always say, we are not going to negotiate with the PLC because if we recognize the internationally recognized government of the PLC, what is the point of the war? So for them, the best way is to negotiate with the political parties who participated in the National Dialogue Conference in 2013. This is what they always say. So again, still we have so many challenges when it comes to the PLC, either on the areas they control or when it comes to any potential negotiations with the Houthis. Okay, great. Um, I We're almost out of time and we have answered every single uh, question from the audience in great detail. You've been an amazing panel. I want to close by asking each of you to as as briefly as possible, please, just tell us what you think the impact of the evolving war between Israel and Hamas is going to be on the situation inside Yemen. Uh, we talked about it, but I'm asking you to close with a very focused, brief comment about how you see the relationship between those two things. Let's start with Eleonora, please. I believe that the Hamas-Israel war will uh, um, will push Yemen to delay in times on uh, negotiations, talks, and uh, uh, a conflict solution perspective. And this stalemate also in negotiations in Yemen is extremely dangerous, since I, I think this will encourage, um, will foster single parts to uh, take the arms and try to, um, to, 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 to gain a, a better position on the ground. So the diplomatic stalemate uh, for me is the, the, the most, uh, um, the most uh, uh, probable uh, outcome of the Hamas-Israel war uh, in Yemen, and uh, it is likely to uh, trigger local parties to resume uh, at least uh, local fightings to, to improve their position on the ground. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was exactly the kind of uh, thing I'm looking for. So I want to uh, offer Greg a chance to give us his own take and about the same time frame. Yeah, thanks. So just briefly, two quick points. I think uh, as the war in Gaza escalates, I think what you'll see is I think you'll see the Houthis rhetorically using this to strengthen their position domestically within the north. And two, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think you'll see the Houthis, particularly if the war escalates quite significantly um, and on multiple fronts, that is not only with Hamas, but with Hezbollah as well. I think the Houthis will see this as a golden opportunity to move on Marib once again. And so those are the two things that I would look for. Both of those obviously have negative impacts on any sort of a peaceful or negotiated settlement to the end of the war in Yemen. 
Sure, unless the 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 uh, Ma'arib bid fails again, and the Houthis finally conclude that they have maximized their territorial prospects, uh, and that might be the basis for some kind. I, I just think that is attributing to the Houthis a, yeah. a level of rationality and lessons learned that the past twenty years have have shown that they um, they just do not yeah. take into account. Alas, alas, alas. Ahmed, your turn. Um, uh, two quick points. Uh, first, I th I don't think any sort of there will be any sort of impact on the Saudi Houthi talks. Uh, from the Houthi perspective, as I heard, the Saudi position towards what's happening in Gaza is relatively balanced comparing to you know previous wars. So I think there will be some sort of freezing, but not negative impact on the course of talks. Uh, the second point related to the uh, public opinions, we are seeing actually growing resentment against the uh, Western states. Uh, because of their position towards Israel and they they their you know um indifference towards the masculine of Palestinians in Gaza. So this of course will impact the rule of international communities and Western states in the country in the future. Fine. Thank you so much. This has been a terrific conversation. I mean, I said this was a dream panel and, uh, you know, no one can deny it after that performance. Thank you so much for joining us, Eleonora, Ahmed and Gregory, uh, first name basis only here. Um, and I really appreciate everybody for taking the time to listen to uh, an issue that remains centrally important, despite everybody's attention in the Middle East focused on Gaza. It is necessary to remember that there is still this conflict in Yemen that is very important, that this is a dire situation, and that the Houthis are players and um, other actors in Yemen also. So uh, thank you all for watching, and please join us again very soon for our next great AGSIW webinar. Thank you all for joining and for watching.